morning, uh, I want us to really look at uh, just one verse in Ephesians chapter 1. But I would like to read the context that reminds us, again, of God's sovereignty in all things, His sovereignty in who is saved, His sovereignty in what actually takes place in the world. Uh, we're dealing with um, a verse that we would call a, the classic passage. You know, there's certain passages that express these truths more clearly than others, and it's, it's good to spend time in, in those and to memorize those particular verses because, well, for that reason, particularly to remind us, but also to be able to teach others. But I would like to read the context beginning in verse 3 of Ephesians 1 through verse 14. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, which He freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ. Also, uh, let's see, um, oh, things in the heavens and things on earth. In him uh, also, and this is where we want to pay attention, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of His glory. In Him, also, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of His glory. You know, I can't think of a simpler way to put it than the way that Paul put it. I'm actually kidding. Uh, there's, there's a lot of truth that's packed into this verse. Um, Paul condenses so much into this passage, but I hope at least some of these things have, have triggered in your mind, the things that you have learned, things that you have been taught before, regarding God's sovereignty and salvation. The reason why He chooses whom He chooses not because of us, not because we were holy and blameless. He chose us so that we would become holy and blameless, but it's that He might glorify His grace and His mercy. It was according to the kind intention of His will. Uh, it was because of His love. Those are the reasons that are given, not because of what is in us. But that's in here, and we'll deal with that just slightly perhaps in the, uh, the message this morning. But the most important thing to see is what is in verse 11, uh, particularly this, these words, that he works all things after the counsel of his will, okay? That is a global, universal statement that tells us that everything is sovereignly in God's hands. Now, um, let's just start with a touch of review. Last week, we were considering that Satan attacks prayer. You know, not all prayer... He actually likes the kind of prayer where, you know, we focus on ourselves and, and hand the Lord our list of things we would like to see that will make our lives more comfortable. Satan likes that kind of praying because that really isn't the kind of prayer that God is going to, to answer. Now, again, he will answer prayers for our needs, but they do need to be subsumed under his glory and the advancement of his kingdom. He, Satan, attacks the kind of prayer that Jesus calls us to pray which is adoring prayer, thankful prayer, confessing prayer, supplicating prayer, the kind of prayer, as Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer, that puts God's interest first in our lives. 
that his kingdom would move forward, that everyone everywhere would, would obey him, in essence, would, would love their neighbor and would love him as he calls them to. A prayer that puts that first, but then is followed by our own interest that the Lord would provide for us the things that we need so that we would be able better uh, to serve him. Now, the devil fights against this kind of prayer because this is the kind of prayer that makes us more like Jesus. You know, we talk about how do we put on the Lord Jesus Christ and put off the flesh? It doesn't happen automatically. It's, it's very hard work. We have to fight against our sins. We have to work on doing what the Lord calls us to do. That is hard work, but it's work that is primarily accomplished by prayer, by wrestling. Like Jacob wrestled with the angel, we need to wrestle with the Lord in prayer to give us the strength to put off those sins. These kinds of prayers make us more like Jesus, and so they make us more of a threat to Satan and his kingdom. And, of course, because uh, the, the kind of prayers that Jesus is calling us to pray, uh, that God's kingdom would advance, these are the prayers that God answers, and these are the prayers that actually threaten Satan's kingdom, and that's why he doesn't want us to pray like this. Well, may the Lord help us to pray more like this, because as we do, we will become more like Jesus, and God's kingdom will advance, and Satan's will retreat. Now today, as I've already mentioned, we want to look at another attack of the enemy, the one that he uses against prayer and against evangelism, and that is, oddly enough, God's sovereignty. Uh, he's using a truth that is in Scripture to try to get us to stop praying and to get us to stop sharing the gospel with others. Now, he reasons in this way, if God is sovereign, and what we mean by that is if he is in absolute control of absolutely everything that takes place in this world, if he has a plan and he's already planned what it is that's going to happen in this world, everything that he is going to do, even down to who it is he's going to save, then why should we bother either to pray or to evangelize since the will of God is going to take place anyway? Well, that's what we want to consider uh, this morning. So first of all, let's consider uh, from our passage what, you know, that God is sovereign and what, what that means and, and what it doesn't mean. Now, let me read again the, the, um, the key passage that I want us to look at here, Ephesians 1, verses 11 and 12. Paul writes to the Ephesians, also we have obtained an inheritance, and that inheritance is heaven. We have obtained the kingdom of God. We are heirs of the new, of the new heavens and the new earth. Why? Having been predestined, predetermined according to his purpose, that is God, who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Now again, the key words I want you to see here this morning is he works all things after the counsel of his will. The counsel of his will means according to his purpose, according to his plan. Now, just to eliminate confusion, uh, we understand that there are two senses in which God wills. And if we don't understand the difference between these two things, we're really not gonna understand what Paul is saying. Uh, there is that which God wants us to do, what his will is for us. And then there is that which he wants to happen, okay? So there is what he wants us to do, and there is what he wants to happen or take place. Now, the first of these two wills we call the will of precept. A precept is a commandment, right? This is what God commands. This is how he wants us to live. This is how he wants everyone to conduct themselves towards him and towards uh, their neighbor. Again, I remind you, this is what Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When he told us to pray that way, what he was saying was pray that everyone in the world obey the precepts of God, his declared will. And of course, that is summarized for us in the Ten Commandments. Now, the second will of God is what he wants to happen, what he has planned from all eternity, before the foundation of the world. What his pleasure is, 
that should actually take place in this world, what actually is taking place in this world. We call this his will of decree. We talk about the decretive will of God. He has, uh, that is what his plan is. Now, that is what Paul is talking about in our passage, is the plan of God, the decree of God. You know, this decree of God, this will of God is something he hasn't revealed to us. It's something that is secret. It's something that only God knows, but we don't know. Now, he reveals his precepts to us, his commandments, so that we can keep them. But we most often do not know what his plan is until he reveals it to us through the events that take place in the world. For instance, you know, a month ago, uh, would we have known that it was God's plan that Hurricane Florence comes through the Carolinas? No, but do we know it now? Yeah, we, we do know it now because as history moves on, we see God's plan unfolding. Now again, before they take place, those things are secret, known only to the mind of God in most cases. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. Okay, that's his secret will, his plan. But the things revealed, that is his law, his commandments, belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. Notice the two wills of God in this passage. Secret plan, express decree, or excuse me, not decree, but precepts, commandments, how we are to live. Now, the exception to this, of course, is when God reveals his plans through the prophets. You know, the, the prophets prophesied of the coming of the Messiah. God was revealing his plan, his secret plan, to his people long before it took place. And in the New Testament, God has also revealed to us a part of that secret plan when he talks about the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is coming and what's going to happen when he actually does come. You see, we couldn't have known that. It's a secret plan of God unless God had revealed it. Now, this plan, this secret plan of God, this decree includes all things, everything, whatsoever comes to pass. It includes the good things that take place as well as the bad things that take place. It includes the natural evil that takes place in the world, Hurricane Florence and many others like it, but it also includes the moral evil that is in the world. It is all inclusive. Paul writes, he works all things after the counsel of his will. God is directing all of these things. Now, how do we know that's true? <laughs> the Bible says it, right? But Jonathan Edwards argued to those who didn't believe this is true, that even if the Bible didn't tell us, even if God didn't expressly tell us in his word that he was absolutely sovereign over everything that takes place, we would still know that it was true because of what God tells us regarding his foreknowledge. God knows what's going to happen, everything that's going to happen from now until eternity, essentially. Now, he reasoned this way. If God knows something is going to happen and God knows all things, right? and yet he does nothing to stop it from happening, okay? And he could, if he wanted to, God can do whatever he wants to do. The conclusion is he must be willing that that thing that he knows is going to happen take place, otherwise he would have stopped it from taking place. In other words, it must be his will that that event take place. Okay, so even the foreknowledge of God tells us that God must be in absolute control of all things because he could stop what he wants to stop, but he doesn't stop it. If it takes place, it must be because God wants it to take place. Now, this idea has led some modern Arminians to essentially um, believe that the future is not certain, that God doesn't know what's going to take place. It's, it's open. You know, we call that open theism, which is you know, a view that we need to avoid. Because if God knows what's going to happen, then it must, certainly, it must be certain that that event's going to take place. And if it's certain that that event's going to take place, then the people who are involved in that event must have to do what it is they're going to do. And if they have to do it, then they can't be free. But they have to be free, you see. So they reason God must not know the future because the future cannot be certain. But I hope you understand that because we serve a God who is unlimited in every way, and he has unlimited knowledge that this being that they're describing who doesn't know the future cannot be God 
because he knows everything. This is the destruction of God. They don't believe in the true God if they don't believe in a God who knows all things. But now here's where things get a little bit more difficult, a little bit more complicated, perhaps uh, technical. This plan and decree is, is more. There's more involved in God's plan than just simply letting things happen. God is the one who works all things after the counsel of his will. He is actively involved in what's going on. He's the one who causes these things to take place, including, ultimately, whoever is going to be saved. Uh, again, in, in this one passage we're looking at, it includes salvation as well as everything else. We have obtained an inheritance in heaven, having been predestined according to his purpose. It's his plan that has eventuated in our salvation. Now, we're not going to talk about election. That's a very large subject we don't have time to deal with this morning. But let's consider what, what this means. God causes everything. We have to be careful now. Okay? God created all things. And he ultimately is the one, according to his plan, who brings everything to pass. But now, think about the things that are in this world. Evil. Sin. How is God involved in those things? Well, you need to understand God did not create evil. And God does not force anyone to sin. God does the things that he does in such a way that he is not responsible for evil. Creatures are responsible for evil. God is responsible for the good. Listen to how the Westminster Confession of Faith puts it in, in chapter 3 and verse 1. And this is very technical language, so I'm just going to unpack it. Uh, I'm just going to read it, and then we'll unpack the ideas that are in it quickly. But Westminster Assembly writes this, God from all eternity, this is talking about the decree of God, God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. He established what was going to take place. It was ordained. It was set. It was certain to take place. But notice, yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. Now, like I said, it's a little bit technical. Let's just try to understand what's being said here. First of all, God is absolutely sovereign, but he is not responsible for the evil that is in the world. That is, he didn't create it, okay? God is good, the Bible tells us. James says in James 1.17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. God is absolute and pure goodness. There is no evil in him. Secondly, James says that he does not force anyone to sin. He does not tempt anyone to sin. As the Westminster Confession of Faith says, he does not offer violence to the will of the creature. He doesn't force us to do anything against our will. James says in James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now, we have to ask ourselves the question, how can both of these things be true? How can God be the creator of all things and yet not be responsible for evil? How can he be in control of all things and yet hold people accountable for the sins that they commit when they are doing what he ordained they would do? Now, again, I'll appeal to Jonathan Edwards because I think he had the best explanation of how we can explain evil in this world when God is the creator of all things. He said this, Evil is not the presence of something, but it is the absence of someone. Now, I put it in those terms. I don't think he used exactly those terms. But notice, evil is not the presence of something. It's not something that exists in and of itself. But it is the absence of someone, okay? The absence of the Holy Spirit. And the reasoning goes like this, just as cold is not something in and of itself, but the absence of heat. And darkness is not really something that exists, but rather it's the absence of light. So evil is the absence of good. Moral evil is all that's left in our hearts when God withdraws. We only sin when God is absent from us. 
So we cannot blame him for our sin. Remember when God made Adam and Eve, right? He endowed them with the Holy Spirit. He made them good. They had what was called original righteousness. They had the desire to do what was good in their hearts. But when they sinned, they lost that. Now all they had was the desire to hide from God and be afraid of God and not to do what God wanted them to do any longer until he redeemed them to himself. Well, they lost the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit was gone, what was left was a void that was like the void light leaves when it's gone, darkness, or the coldness when the heat is gone. It left evil. So we can't blame God for sin because sin is, is essentially when God withdraws. That's what causes it. And he withdraws because of the sin or decisions, essentially, that his creatures make. It's a just withdrawal. Same thing happens to us as believers. You know, we, we pray to be filled with the Spirit. We read the Word. We pray. We, we get energized. And then we go out and we make decisions we know are contrary to God's will. We sin. And when we do that, it grieves and quenches the Holy Spirit. And then we lose something of that. God withdraws. That's what David was praying in Psalm 51. He, he, he knew from his sin with Bathsheba and having Uriah the Hittite put to death in order to cover over his sin and take his wife, he had grieved the Spirit of God. He felt the Lord withdraw, and he says, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. He sensed that withdrawal, and he knew what it was doing to his life. But restore to me the joy of your salvation. So the absence of God is what creates, as it were, this situation. So God is not responsible for that. We are responsible for that. Now, another question is this. If God is absolutely sovereign and he's the ultimate cause of everything that happens, how can he blame us for what we do? How can we actually be free? How can we make significant choices? You see, if we can't actually choose what we freely want, then how can God hold us responsible for the sins that we actually commit? You know, R.C. is going to go into depth on that particular issue tonight, but let me just say this about that. The fact that God holds us responsible for our sins, I mean, there is a day of judgment, right? The fact that he's going to hold us accountable if we're outside of Christ. The fact that he's going to hold anybody accountable for their sins means that they must be responsible for those sins because God is a just God. He wouldn't force somebody to sin and then punish them for committing that sin. I think the illustration of, um, I think R.C. Sproul may have used this, of, uh, let's say, a a, a vase that, that perhaps is very precious to a mother. And a father takes his three-year-old toddler and, and takes him by the arms and walks behind him and, and he has him pick up the vase like this and move it over to this uh, tile floor and then he pulls the child's hands back and the vase shatters on the floor and then he turns the child around and he says, bad boy, you broke your mother's vase. Well, could you hold that little child responsible for breaking that vase if the father actually forced him to do it? No, and neither does God. You see, that's what he would be doing to us if he forced us to sin and then punished us for the sin. The fact that we are responsible means we must be free. It means he must not violate our freedom or force us to do anything against our will. And the point here is this, that God is absolutely sovereign, but we are free to choose what we want you know, the bondage comes with what it is we want. If, if we're outside of Christ, all we want is sin. We're bound to choose only sin because that's what we want. But in Christ, we can choose good. And sadly, we can still choose to sin. But all of God's creatures are free to choose what they want to choose. And yet, when they choose what they want, what they freely want, they're actually choosing what God ordained that they would choose. Now, the mystery between those two things is great, but it simply says that God uses the free actions. He takes into account the free choices of his creatures in his plan, and his plan does not force his creatures to do anything against their will. But now let's get to the point of this. If God has planned what will certainly take place, you know, whatever it comes to pass, including who's going to be saved and who isn't going to be saved, why should we pray? Why should we evangelize? Now, Satan, this is where he challenges us. He's going to ask us the question, does it really make any difference what you do, what I do? Does it matter if you pray at all? If you pray for something God doesn't want to happen, is that thing going to happen? No, it's not going to happen. If God wants it to happen, it's going to happen whether you pray or not. That's what he's going to say. 
And isn't the same thing true with regard to salvation? If he wants somebody to be saved, he's going to save that person. If he doesn't want somebody to be saved or if he's choosing not to have mercy on them, perhaps a better way to put it, and he, he's not going to have mercy on them, so why bother to evangelize? Well, we need to be able to overcome that objection and that attack, and, and this is how we do it. First of all, God commands us to pray, and he commands us to evangelize. That's the end of the, that settles the question of what we are to do, Right? I mean, Jesus not only tells us to pray, he actually tells us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer so that God's will would be done. He also tells us to evangelize. Remember the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20? Jesus said to his disciples, and that obligation is passed down to us, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's no question. We're commanded to pray. We're commanded to evangelize. Peter actually tells us we need to be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that is within us. So even if we believed that the things that he calls us to do would make no difference at all, we should still do it because that's what he tells us to do. That's what it means that he is the Lord and we are his servants. But I think the larger question is, why would he tell us to do these things if they really made no difference at all? And again, I've already answered that question. The answer is that God's sovereignty not only does not destroy our responsibility. You know, again, God's not going to hold us accountable for things we had no responsibility over, had no power over. His sovereignty also does not take away the means by which God accomplishes his ends, okay? He has his plan, which are the, the ends, but, but the means are also a part of that plan. And that's what the Westminster Confession of Faith was actually saying when it said in this highly technical language, no, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established you see, God is the first cause. He's the one that makes, ultimately makes everything happen, but he makes it happen according to second causes, and we are those second causes. So what he's saying is that that connection of what we do to his plan is there. God has established it. So in his plan, our freedom, our liberty remains intact, as we saw before, but so does the connection between what we do and what God actually has planned will take place, what he wants to take place. His plan doesn't take away the significance of what we do, as though it doesn't matter. It guarantees that what we do will be significant, that it will make a difference. I mentioned last week that the Lord doesn't do his work. Um, uh, he doesn't do his work uh, except through the way that he has chosen uh, to do this work, which is an answer to our prayers. The same thing is true with regard to evangelism. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. He tells us essentially that if we don't evangelize, if we don't do the work of missions, no one is going to be saved. Listen to what he says. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Now I want you to notice the, the connection here between salvation and what we do. How can they believe unless, they, unless they, they hear? And how can they hear unless somebody is sent to preach the gospel to them? Somebody has to go. They have to hear before the Lord is going to save them. It doesn't happen automatically. We need to understand that when we pray, we're not just bouncing our prayers off of some kind of an impenetrable decree of God as though it's wrapped up in some sort of a you know, stainless steel container. And we're just sort of like throwing little BBs against it and, and we're not getting through and what's inside is going to happen anyway. Our prayers are inside that container, so to speak. It's a part of God's plan. And when we evangelize, we're not just wasting our breath speaking to people who are not going to respond. 
the Lord says he's going to use our prayers and our evangelism actually to bring about his purposes and their salvation. Now this, let me just say this in closing, this is why we, um, we can know that when we pray that God will hear us and he will answer our prayers when we pray in the way that Jesus told us to pray. And this is how we can know that when we evangelize that the Lord is going to use our efforts to bring his lost sheep home. You know, there are those who, who believe that this view of the sovereignty of God actually destroys evangelism. You know, on, uh, why should I evangelize? Because I can't really do anything. But it was this conviction that compelled George Whitfield, essentially the greatest evangelist in history, next to the Apostle Paul, and Charles Spurgeon, and Jonathan Edwards, and others who were of this persuasion, this conviction is what persuaded them to evangelize because it gave them the confidence that there would be those who would actually be saved. You know, if we understand what the Bible says about what man is like, apart from the grace of God, and we think, I'm going to tell them about Christ, they're going to spit in my face. They're going to hate me. They're not going to listen to me. They're not going to be changed. They're going to make fun of me. I'm going to be the brunt of all their jokes and so forth. Yeah, if, if God wasn't involved in it, that's what's going to happen because that's what's in their hearts and that's how they're going to view us. It looks a little bit out of step to talk to people about Jesus. But when you realize that this is the only way that God is going to save and that he says that he's going to use what you do, what I do, and that message to bring those people to him, then we can know that it's, it's not going to be a waste, even though we may have to suffer some of those you know, in, indignities from the hands of others for uh, our efforts. So the point is, we must not let Satan convince us that God's sovereignty means that our efforts are going to be wasted. God's sovereignty is the only reason that our efforts will not be wasted. We need to remember that, believe that, and, and act upon that. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to do that.